Hello and welcome to Griffin Art and today I want to show you how to make this tissue box container that is made out of A4 cardstock. Now this particular box has just had a paint finish but if I quickly just show you the original prototype design which is slightly different in design I will also be showing you how to apply a wash finish so that you achieve this more aged look if that's the type of finish that you would prefer. So just by way of introduction, if we just take a quicker look at this box so that you can you know, get a better idea of what it is that we'll be making. This is actually a very sturdy box. Um, if we take a look at the bottom here, although it's made out of card, those card sections are layered up and that produces these extra thick areas. So the box base itself is extremely strong. You've got hard sides and probably the, one of the weaker sections is this little upstand. But that's supported by layered die cut shapes with these bracket shapes that give that strength. And by using them also on this central back section, I don't know whether you can see how thick they are, then again, that provides strength and support. Now, the box just works by this drawer. These are actually mock drawer fronts. And if I pull this out, you'll be able to see that we've got a containing box with a plinth and obviously the hole in the top. And then we've got this drawer section to take our tissue box. And it's backless, so we can easily get our tissue box in and out of there. And you know, again, the front is layered, so you've got a lot of strength there. So that's essentially how that works. It's just a question of probably tucking that in, popping your drawer in there, and then out pop your tissues. Now, if you are planning on making this box, I would suggest that you check the measurement of your tissue box and make sure that it's going to fit within this. And, you know, obviously you can adopt, ad adapt the dimensions accordingly. However, there is another option. These uh, square tissue boxes are often just comprised of the tissues that come out of those more long, flat, rectangular boxes, and they simply fold them in half. So in this case, although my box would have fitted in here, I wanted to demonstrate how you can do this. You can simply take the tissues out of your box, and you've made a containing box here for them. So if your box is a little bit big, don't worry, it's not the end of the world. You can simply remove the tissues out of their original packaging and use this little container box that you've made for the packaging instead. And that works adequately. Now, before we get started on the creative aspect of making this box, I do just want to make you aware that whilst this box is not difficult to make, it has a lot of components. Some of the aspects of the preparation need time to dry. And I'd be very surprised if you completed this project in less than a three day period. Now, I've actually created a PDF file for you that's downloadable from my website at griffinart.co.uk. And I will include a link to that in the description area for this video. Before we get into the craft process, what I would say is that one of the main time consuming aspects of this box is the layering up and gluing together of card to provide strong components. So if we take a look at this box section, for example, you can see how thick the sides of this box is. And that's because this is made up of five layers of just A4 card that have been glued together to provide card that is much thicker. Now I've chosen to do this because I want my subscribers to know that whatever project has been produced by Griffin Art, they can make out of A4 card. So if you choose to exchange some of these components and just cut them out of mount board that's absolutely fine and that obviously will then progress your project more quickly 
So with that in mind, let's just take a quick look at this document that you are going to need in order to progress this project. Now, one of the things I've done is I've kept individual components to a single page in the document. So on this page, apart from the die cut section, which I'll mention again in a minute, we've got everything that you need to make up the box base plinth. And within that, you've got your card sizes and you've got this little extra part of the table that says laminate in advance or after prep. So the first thing that you're going to be looking for in this project is for the components that can be laminated in advance. And all that means is that you're taking the card size, the number that you need, and you're gluing them together. So in this instance, these are the um, components that you may be able to swap out for your chipboard or artist mount board. Just be aware that you might want to check sizes and make sure that it doesn't alter any of the dimensions. So let's have a look at the plinth section here to start with, and I can show you what that lamination process involves. Right, so I have actually pre-cut my components. So this is the plinth strengthener, which according to my PDF document is five and five eighths by five inches. So that's what I've got here. And I require two and I can laminate them in advance. So here we have the two and I've labeled them up as well because I will be painting the surface of my box. So I'll be painting over any labeling. So, you know, it's best just to label them up so you know exactly what they are. Some of these things can look very similar in size, so labels do help. So all I'm now going to do is use my normal combination of double-sided tape and glue. So I'll just put a couple of pieces of tape on just so that you know it gives me that instant grab. And then I'm going to apply my normal PVA glue to that card. And I do want to have the coverage uh, to be total because otherwise it can leave little bubbles of air in there. Ooh, just spilled some of my glue. I'll tidy that up in a minute. Um, so, you know, you do want to make sure that the coverage is good. I may as well use that. It does seem like a lot of glue and this is why it needs to be allowed time to dry overnight under a weight. Because you know it's absorbing into that card and it will make it warp and bow if you don't dry it under weight. So you can see that's got a nice coverage on there, plenty of glue. So all I'm now going to do is take the backing tape off that double sided tape and that's going to help to um, grab that card as well. And then I'm just going to line up, actually I'll probably do it this way because I know they were the same size, the labels on the front. Just line it all up Make sure that the edges meet because, again, you do want these to be the same size. I haven't done that very well, actually. get a feel for whether those edges are coming together. If there is a little excess, you can always trim it back. But um, that's the main thing. And I haven't actually got my bone folder to hand, but normally I would use my bone folder just to help flatten that out all out. And then that just needs to go under a weight to keep it flat and allow it time to dry. So that's what I'm going to do now. 
So with that under a weight, and I know that that's going to dry now nice and flat, all I need to do now is go through my document and find any areas where there's a tick in this column laminate in advance. You can see two in that one. So we've got the back strengtheners and we've got the main box sides that we can do. So, you know, we can do that. And if, if you need any extra information, there's the basic notes for you as well. So you can follow that through. But basically where it says laminate in advance, there's no work to be done. You just cut the, the card to size and glue them together in the way that I've just done for that plinth strengthener. So that's, that's what I will now do off camera. I'll go through all of those um, tables and I'll prepare those sections and laminate them. Now the only other thing I want to say before I leave you to do that task, the reason why we allow those components to laminate overnight, if I can just take these tissues out of here, is because if you don't, I was impatient with my prototype as you can see here, and if you don't keep them under weight and allow them to thoroughly dry out, they will have this tendency to bow. And whilst I don't dislike that, it's quite quirky, it, it gives the box an element of interest, it's definitely not what I was looking for and it probably isn't what you want either. So just be patient. Uh, just enter this project knowing it's going to take you a few days and give your components time to dry out. So I'll get on with that first part of the work and I'll come back to you when that's ready to go. Right, so that's the first level of preparation complete. And I have had these under a weight and they're going straight back there because they haven't been there long and certainly not overnight. But I wanted to just run through with you what components that has left us with. Now, we've got our plinth strengthener, which is what we did in the demonstration earlier. We've got our box draw front, so that's number two. The third piece is our back strengthener. And then I've got two more sections which are two main box sides, so both the same. So that it's five components that you should now have at this stage, just to make you aware. So I'm going to put those back under a weight and then we can look at doing the next section of preparation. Right, so having been through our guiding document, our PDF document, and found all these areas where we can do some lamination in advance, the second thing we're going to do is work through that document again and just find where we can do uh, laminate after prep. So wherever there's a tick in that box, laminate after prep, that's what we're now looking for. And we're just going to work our way methodically through this document. So you may not see this document much again, but that's basically what I'm doing. And I'm going to start with my main box plinth and I've already got that component in front of me here on my scoring board. Right, so I'm scoring on the wrong side of my card and I'm just going to be scoring at three quarters of an inch and one and five eighths of an inch and I'll be doing that on all four sides. So I'll come back to you when that's complete. Right, so then that component has now been scored on all four sides of the card in the same way. And I'm now just going to, I've, I've folded and creased most of them. I've got the last set to do, which I'm now going to do. So it's just a question of folding over and applying pressure to, along that line. Now, when you do this, if you just make sure that you're lining up, I can bring this to the camera, you've probably seen me explain this before, you need to line up the fold line on one side of the card with the score line on the other, rather than try and line up the edges of your card which may not be square. So as long as you do that, when you're folding and creasing, you should end up with a square component. So that's all of those in place. So the next thing that we need to do is remove the excess card to form our tray style pattern for our plinth. And if I show you, we've got these four square or rectangular cells in the corners here. And the only one we're interested in retaining is this one. So these three on the outside are going to be 
removed. And we're going to do that by cutting away the fold lines. So we're cutting the card, the excess card away, including the fold line. We don't need that either. It just gets in the way of construction. So I'll just do the one. So this corner as well, including the fold line. So that you're end up ending up with this sort of um, pattern on each corner of, of the whole piece of card. So I'll do the rest off camera and come back to you at that point. Right, so those corners are now all the same. And the last thing that we need to do is just snip into them to create the tabs, which will enable us to put our plinth together or construct it. Now it doesn't matter which way you snip into these corners. You can either do along this line or along that line. It doesn't matter. But I would suggest that once you've made up your mind, do the opposite one and then the facing one. So let, let me just show you. So I'm just cutting down, in this case, the center of that fold line to create a little tab. So I'm going to do the same the other side, so the sort of the mirror image of it. And then I'm just going to flip the card around. So those are my tabs there. And I'm going to do exactly the same on this side as well. So we do that one to create the tab opposite. And also this one. Now at this point we can fetch our plinth strengthener which we laminated earlier today. It still needs to be allowed to dry out further but we want this component ready for tomorrow. So all I'm going to do is apply some glue to the back of it and that is going to get stuck to the top of the uh, plinth pattern section so that it will be positioned like this. So I'm just going to apply glue in the same way as we laminated earlier. I'll put that on the top there off camera and I will just come back and show you how that's looking. So just to provide clarity. Right, so that's now glued in place. And I just wanted to show you when this component goes together, it's going to go together like this. So that strengthening section has been placed on the decorative side, so the upper side of the box. And this is how our plinth will form once it's thoroughly dried out. So just to further clarify, this is the section that we're starting to build here. This is the beginnings of our, the, our plinth and it will end up like this, okay? So I'll put that back under a weight and come back to you at that point. Right, so simply working through that PDF instruction document, I've now moved on to the next page and I've, I'm dealing with my main box back section. So I've simply taken that and scoring on the wrong side, I've placed that on my scoreboard and I've scored a line at three quarters of an inch as per the instructions. So I can now fold and crease that line and that means I can take my back strengthener. Now this strengthener, unlike the plinth, this strengthening section will be on the inside of the box. So we are going to glue that to the wrong side of our card and it doesn't matter which way, I shall probably glue it that way so that I lose the label and just retain the main box back label on the back there. So I'm just going to do the same, take the same approach as normal, glue that in position, and I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so then that's now glued in place and ready to go under a weight, because you can see that's already having that tendency to bow. Now, the only thing I wanted to say to you is when you glue that in position, place it with the glue so that with this folded side up so that you know that it's not going to interfere with the fold. We'll be creating the other fold line later on in the project, so that's fine. Right, so the next component that we're going to be dealing with is our main box top internal strengthener. And it's at this point that we're going to be starting to cut that hole in the top of the box for our tissues. Now I am going to be cutting the holes in the center of this component 
and I'm going to be using a one and seven eighths of an inch die cutter for that purpose and I'm also going to be using a template to make life easier and I'm going to show you how to make this template so that you're sure that you are positioning that hole centrally so that's what's coming up now. Now, I'm not very good at math, and this is the approach that I take. There may be an easier method, and you know, by all means, let me know if that's the case. But all I've done is I've taken a scrap piece of card, and I've cut it to the same size as this component, so 5 and 5 eighths by 5 inches. I've then drawn across the diagonals to, to find out where the center of this card will be. So with that done, I can then die cut the size circle that I want to take out of that center and and at that point I can fold that die cut circle so another scrap piece of card into half and then into quarter so that I can identify where the center of the circle is so by doing that I can then stick a pin in there I can then in effect so let's just get rid of that for the moment if this was my scrap card for my die cut and I got my center position marked in there, I can then set that circle back in my die cutter, position it with the pin through it and put the pin, match the pin onto the center position for this component. And that will then give me the place at which I need to cut the hole. I can pass that through my die cutter, I can leave this card in place, it's not a problem, and that will then cut my hole centrally to my template. So I've got this sort of set up here. And then when that comes away, my template is formed and ready to go. What that then means is that I can use my template with anything where I want to position that card I can put my die cutter in place, line up the edges of my template and pass that through my die cutter like that and that hole will always be in the right position. So that's what I'm going to do next. With both of these pieces, I'll just pass that through my die cutter with that template in position and that will cut my holes where I need them. So I'll get that job done and come back to you at that point. Right, so those holes are now cut in those, and that means I can glue these two together to act as that strengthener. But before I do that, I just want to make you aware of something in case you want to change the design in any way. The holes here are central to this component, but they are not central to the top of this box. I've done it, I prefer it this way because what it means is that the, you know, there's an, a, a deeper section here which is more in proportion with these side sections and there's a less deep section at the back but that tends to be hidden by the tissue so that's why I have made that central to this component rather than to this tabletop component which we will also need to cut a hole in so I just want to make that clear in case you want to you know look at bringing that forward a little bit so that, there you go I'm now going to glue these together in the way that we've done before so that we've got a strengthening section and that will go under a weight overnight to dry. So with the internal strengthener done for the top, I can now move on to my actual main box top component. And I've already placed this in my scoring board as per the PDF instructions. And I've scored at three quarters of an inch and at one and a half inches on the wrong side of the card. Now I do need to cut a hole in this section, but if we take a look at my Sizzix cutting plate and place that on there, we can see that that is not going to pass through the machine, it's too wide. So in order to get around that problem, we're first going to fold and score this second score line in. So I'm just going to crease that. And that is now providing me with the back of my box. So I can now return to my template and place that on that fold line. And I know that that will now be from back to front in the position that I need it to be. 
Now, the only thing I have also got to bear in mind is I want it to be central on this axis as well. So as long as I place this template one and three quarter inches in from this side here, then I know that that is going to be central. So I can now place my die cutter in the center there, fold that over, run that through my die cutter, and that will achieve the hole in the position that I want it. So I'll do that off camera and come back to you at that point. Right, so now that that hole has been cut in place, I can take that main box top internal strengthener that we completed just moments ago, and that can be placed in the position of the template on the wrong side of the box. So this is going to be uh, located inside our box. And I will simply do the normal, apply glue to the surface and stick that in place and then place it under a weight to dry out overnight. Now the next thing that comes up on our list of things to do relates to the corners, the main box corners. And we've got two of these at the back of our box and we've got two at the front. And we've also got a similar thing going on here at the front base and I have classified that as a corner in the instructions. Now excluding the uh, front base section, all of the other corners are handled in exactly the same way, although the card sizes are different. So all we're going to do, scoring on the wrong side of our card, so for the rear and for the front, I've done one here that you, so that you can possibly see, we're scoring at three quarters of an inch and at one and a half inches. So that's the rear one. And again, if you can see, we scored three quarters and one and a half, and that's left us with a three quarter inch for the front one. So let's just do the rear one. So three quarters of an inch and one and a half inches. And then you just put the other one in, scoring on the wrong side, three quarters of an inch, one and a half inches. So, and that finishes the scoring for that. Now, the principle remains the same for the main box corner's front base except that the scoring position is slightly different. So for that front, which is this front section here, we're going to be scoring at 7 eighths of an inch. Double check that. And 1 and 3 quarters of an inch. Okay, and then we can treat all of those in the same way. So if I just move the scoring board out of the way for a moment, what we're going to be doing with all of these is just folding and creasing along that first score line where it meets up with the following score line. And then we're just going to crease that line in place. So we're just doing that. You can see on, on this one, which is the front base, which ones are going to form the double layer. So this little one is not going to cover this section. So it's these two that need to come together. So that's all you're doing. And this one, which is the corners front, has equal amounts. So that's straightforward enough. And I've already done the other two. So all I'm going to do here now is apply some glue and stick that down. So I'll do that off camera and I will come back to you and show you the finished result just so that that's clear to you. Right, so all of those have been glued down and I'm hoping that you can see all it, all that means is that you've got a double layer of card on one of the edges on each of these corner sections. So that's all there is to that. So I'm going to just now put those under a weight and they can dry off overnight. Now if we take a quick look at our box, we can see that we've got a similar thing going on along this base edge here. So these little strip things. And that brings us on to the next item on our list of things to do, which relates to box ed base edges. And we've got three of these cards. Now, I have already prepared these because, you know, I think you can see what card scoring is all about now. So they've just been placed 
in the scoring board and scored down the centre of the card, which is at one and five eighths of an inch, but that is on the document for you. So all I will be doing with these is folding and creasing along that score line. And then I'll be gluing these sections in half so that we've got a double thickness of card there. And again, those will then just be popped under a weight to dry overnight. Now, the last thing that we're going to tackle for the very base of this box in terms of preparation are these base finishing strips. And we've actually got four of those. Now, the, the card sizes are on that document and the locations for scoring, but all we're doing, and I have already prepared one, a couple here, we're putting that in our scoring board in portrait mode and we're scoring at a three quarters of an inch mark. We're then turning that to score a second line at three eighths of an inch. And what we're going to do here is just fold and crease those that score line in the usual way. Do them both because it'll make life easier moving forward. And then all I'm going to do is glue that section down, including this end bit, just glue the whole lot down for each of those four pieces. And that is my preparation finished for today. Right, so with that job done, we can now move on to the top of our main box and deal with the tabletop, which is this section here. Now, the first thing that we come across in our table of instructions is the tabletop itself. So this is the largest part. So without this little extra lip, it's this large part here. And because it's supporting everything else, that's thicker than some of the other components. So in this case, we've got three pieces of card that will need to be laminated together to form that strength. Now, before we can laminate them, we need to cut the hole in the top again, as normal. And we can use our template to do this. You know, just find out where the central piece section is by measuring in from the sides. And you, if I put it on here, you can see where that needs to be placed. So we're going to do exactly the same on here. So as we did before, I'll measure in and make sure that the space either side is equal. And using that um, die cut section, I'll just pass that through my die cutter to create the holes exactly as we did earlier on today. So I'll get that job done and come back to you when that's ready to go. Right, so having cut the holes in all of my three tabletop sections, so they all line up nice and neatly and I can see you know, which is going to be at the back and which is the front, so that's fine. Before I go anywhere further and glue these together, I'm going to turn my attention to my tabletop cover, which will be used to bind all these and, and in, in so doing, create a nice soft edge to that tabletop. So the, the first thing that I want to do, again, you can immediately see that this is not going to go through my die cutter, it's too wide. So I'm going to score a line before I do anything else. So I've placed my card in portrait mode as per my instructions. And I'm going to be scoring at one and three eighths of an inch. Now, because this width from here to here is also still too wide for my die cutter, I'm also going to score at six and seven eighths of an inch. I can now fold and crease those lines. And you now I can take this tabletop and place that in that section there. And it doesn't have to be exact because you know these are going to be folded over. So I can now place that in position. I can put my die cutter in the middle there run that through my die cutter just by folding these edges over and then that will cut that hole in the position that I want it. So I'm going to do that off camera and then I'll come back to you at that point. 
Right, so as you can see, that's now had the hole cut in there, which means that I can now glue all these sections together. And, and once they've dried off a little bit, I can then glue them in position on the wrong side of the tabletop cover here because the cover is going to enclose them eventually. So I'm going to get to that stage of camera. You've seen a lot of that process going on already today. So I think you know exactly what we're about here. So I'll do that off camera to save time and I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so that's my tabletop cover ready to go. It's got its strengthening section glued to the inside and that's ready to go. Now we've got a secondary layer here which creates this little aesthetic lip and also strengthens the whole of this tabletop further and we're going to be following a very similar method with the next two pieces of card in order to achieve a similar result to this. So I've got two pieces of card which are tabletop embellishment layer and they are equivalent to this tabletop section here. And again, we need to have holes cut into those. So I can use my template again, and I'm not, I'm, I'll am not. i do this off camera, but I'm going to just run you through what that process is. So I'm gonna use my template again and put it towards the back of these uh, uh, card shapes so that I know it's going to line up. I'll make sure that the distance either side is the same you probably can see exactly what's going on now because it's very much the same as before. Run that through the die cutter, create the holes. Now, once I've got the hole cut there, I can then place that on this card here and there's no need to score this cover, cover layer at all because it will go through the die cutter at this size. So once the holes are cut, I can use this as a, as a means of positioning the hole in the cover as well. So that'll just run through the die cutter. So I'm going to do that um, and then glue these sections together and prepare this ready for going under that weight overnight. And I will just show it to you at its completed stage for further clarification. Right, so just to clarify, that's now our tabletop embellishment layer ready to go under a weight to dry overnight. So the two smaller sections of card have been glued together and then in turn they've been glued centrally more or less on this larger section of card which will then be used to cover it tomorrow. So with that done that's all the preparation work we can do for this main box section today and that means we can move on to the drawer and you'll be pleased to know that's slightly less involved. Right so moving on to our box drawer the main box section is made of two pieces of card that are exactly the same size and although this is explained in those uh, instructions that you can download I just want to show you the difference between the treatment of these two pieces. So in the first instance we're scoring and I've already done this at five the five inch mark and that's in portrait mode. We're then going to turn that card anti-clockwise and that's the thing to remember anti-clockwise and we're going to score at five and a quarter. Now for the second piece we're doing exactly the same thing to start with so five inches but then we're turning in the opposite direction clockwise and scoring at the five and a quarter inch mark and what that means is that you end up with a pattern that is the mirror image if I put them together and bring them up to the camera I'm hoping that you can see that the lines are offset so it's the mirror image that we've got with these card pieces and that means that we're going to be able to overlap these two larger sections and glue them together and that will form the front edge of this box section with these two pieces forming the sides. So all we need to do now is fold and crease those lines, which I'll quickly do. I'm going to do the same with both of these. So just fold and crease, making sure those lines line up.
and then all I'm going to do is this is the larger of the two square or rectangle shapes up here and it's the this area underneath the large one that we don't need so I'm going to cut away including the fold line that excess card so just In the interest of time, I'll do the other one off camera. Right, so now that that excess card has been cut from below that, below that larger panel on each piece of card, all I'm now going to do, and I'll do it off camera to save time, is to actually glue those large sections to each other so that they completely overlap just you know use the folds to line them up on the inside and the on, and the outside make sure it's not interfering with the fold just glue them together and then put them under a weight just so that they've got a chance to dry out now whilst that's taking a little while to dry the next thing on our list is the internal front and base reinforcing panel and as per the instructions I've already placed that in landscape mode on my scoring board and I've scored at the five inch mark so I can now fold and crease along that score line. Now at this point we can retrieve our pattern again with that glued center section and on the wrong side because this reinforcing section goes on the inside of our jaw we're just going to provide further reinforcing by gluing that section where it fits you know that it isn't symmetrical uh, on the inside of that central panel so just to give you a quick look at that just so that you can see how that's gone with that's on the inside as you can see it's not interfering with any of those fold lines so it's placed nicely to prevent interference there and also this fold line here lines up with the, the fold lines of the adjacent flaps so that's what you're looking for now all that leaves us to do is to put a little bit of reinforcing on either of these panels and that's where the next item on the list, these internal side reinforcing panels come in. So all that you need to do there is to glue these on the inside again, these are internal as stated and they need to go on the ends, either end here. Now when you're, when you're gluing these, if you line them up with the outside edges top and side that means that they are not going to interfere with that folding at all they are slightly narrower to allow for that if you were to place them absolutely adjacent to this other piece when you came to fold you would be hindered a little so just line them up with the external edges and you'll be fine so that's what I'm going to do now is glue those in place and then put them under a weight and that section can now be left to dry off overnight. Right, so the only thing left that we can actually do today is to sort out our die cut shapes. And first of all, I just wanted to let you know, in case you're interested, the die cutter that I'm using is um, one of Marianne Designs. It's, it's Marianne Creatables and it's item number LR0143 and you get both those die cutters in that set so I will put the details in the description area for you in case you're interested in those. Now for this particular project you're going to need 14 of this die cut shape and 10 of this smaller bracket style shape. Now to, out of those 14 of that first style you are going to need two that are remaining completely intact without all the little cutouts pushed through so just it will it will be revealed as to why that's necessary as we progress tomorrow but just bear that in mind so you need two that are intact and the remaining 12 cutout shapes as normal if we deal with these shape to start with, so we'll just ignore those little bracket ones for the time being. 
as that's the way. The remainder of these shapes need to be glued together in pairs. Each, each the drawer on the front here has got four of the shapes, but they are a double layer. So you've got eight of those shapes there. And then the back here has two double layers at the front and two at the back. So that will give you some idea. Now, in case you haven't seen me demonstrate putting together such shapes, fiddly shapes like this before, I'm just going to do a quick demonstration next. So I like to make sure I've got a piece of absorbent tissue or paper towel, kitchen, kitchen towel in this case. And then I just use a liberal amount of glue because sometimes quite thin areas on some of these die cuts, this one's not too bad, but you do want to make sure that the whole area sticks down and you know you don't get little sections lifting up. So decent amount of glue to start with, as you can see here. I'm just going to dab away to make sure that that covers the entire area of the back of that shape. And you can see there's way too much glue on there, but that is the point. It does help to get coverage if you put too much on. So having done that, we can then place that down on our absorbent towel tissue, and we're going to take off the excess because if we were to leave that on, and there's still too much there for my liking, so just take it off. As, as I was saying, if we were to leave that on, it would just ooze all over the place, so you don't really want that. Now we're just left with a stickiness on that back surface, and that's going to enable us to join these two shapes together. So we're just lining up all the edges, really straightforward, and then we can just apply a little pressure on a flat surface and that one's layered up and ready to go. So that's ready for tomorrow. So that's one thing that I wanted to mention to you and I will do the rest with these remaining sets. So they all need to be glued together in pairs and these ones just left until tomorrow. With regard to these remaining bracket die cuts, I do just want to go through these with you. It is detailed in the PDF document what you need to do with these and with the other die cuts, but I just want to show you so that you've got something to relate to as a visual. Now, each side of this little back upstand section takes five of these die cuts, and there are two on the inside, and then there are three on the outside okay and because if you're using a different die cut by the way as long as they're symmetrical so that you can put them the wrong sides together and they still give you that embellishment shape so if you're if you're looking for an alternative just make sure it's symmetrical you'll be fine now so let's take the two that are going to go on the inside to start with and what what we need to work on is the fact that it's got these little tiny lugs and they get in the way. So the two, for the two that go on the inside, we need to trim those lugs away. So I'm just going to do that now. Move it out of the way. So I'm just cutting them off so I end up with a straight edge. And that deals with that pair. So they can then get glued together in the same way as I've just shown you. Now for the remaining three, you do have to bear in mind that they are handed. So if you're working on this side of the box, you want to retain this nice little lug here because it's a bit of a feature. I mean, you can take it off if you want, if that makes life easier, but I like to leave it on. So in this case, the it, it, we're, we're facing in this way, so it's this bottom lug that needs to be removed. So I'll just do one in this case, because you've seen me do that. Right, so this is where I want to demonstrate that it's handed. The, obviously you can easily cut another set of two that way. And this one is now cut for this side. 
Now I just want to show you that if I had cut all six the same way, then when I come to fit it on this side, it's not going to work. So they are handed, bear that in mind. So when you come to do the, the set of three for the other side, you're going to want to cut off the other lug so that it's this bottom one that's removed. So that's all you need to bear in mind. I hope that makes that clear for you. I'm going to do that off camera and then I won't come back now until tomorrow. Right, so we've reached day two and what that means is that we're going to return to the first page of our PDF instruction document. And in this case, we're going to be looking out for all references to day two. Now they may be in the header bar of a table as is the case with this day one or they'll be in bold within the basic notes section so they're fairly easy to spot and we're now just going to methodically work our way back through the document and undertake those day two tasks. So in front of me here I've now returned to my plinth and you can already see that I've applied some double-sided tape to the areas that require adhesion. Now in the interest of time because you've seen me glue plenty of times I'm going to show you what I'm going to be gluing but I'll do the gluing off camera. Now the plinth is actually a tray style construction and if you remember we've got our strengthener on the decorative side so this will end up on the top of our plinth. Now the first thing that I'm going to do is glue down these flaps where these tabs are top and bottom so I'm going to do that next. Now the next thing that we can do is to sort out these tabs and, and to form our corners. Now I've already done the first two so that I can demonstrate why I like to, to treat these in pairs. So glue them both up at the same time if, if, if you can. Now I just want to show you, if you get this one in place, you may have seen me illustrate this before, and you've left this tab out, it's not too bad with a tray this size, but it's not as easy to get that onto the inside of your box. So it's best to just glue them up in pairs and put them in place at the same time. Now all you're doing, apply some glue to the tab, draw up this section until you've got a nice, neat corner, then you can apply some pressure on the inside with your bone folder so that you know that that then glues down and forms a good bond. Right, so with those corners nicely formed, our next task is just to apply some glue along these remaining two flaps and glue them onto the inside of our plinth and that will complete this part of the project. Right, so now that our plinth is finished, we can move on to page three of our document, uh, which is the main box assembly section. We covered everything on page two yesterday. And the first thing that we're going to be looking at here is our main box back section. And all I'm going to do to start with, we've got this side with a score line that was folded, but this one is uh, still flat. So all I'm going to do to start with is use the edge of that strengthening section to score a line now that that's nice and firm and dry and that will just enable me to create a fold along that line which will help in the construction process. Now as you might expect this is the back section so it's going to be glued to the back of our plinth so that it's flush with the bottom of the plinth. So to start with, all I'm going to do is apply the glue to the back section here, and then I'll glue that in place, and I'll come back to you then. Right, so now that that has been glued into place, I need to then glue these flaps to the side of the plinth at the bottom here as well. So all I'm going to do to give me an idea of how much glue that I need, is I'm going to fold that flap around the corner of that plinth so I can see the position. I'm just going to use my pencil to mark a little line. And I can now just apply glue to this section here below that pencil mark and then I can glue that in place. So I'll do that to both sides. 
Now, I just wanted to also point out that when you do this uh, section, these, these flaps around the corner, do try and make sure that you keep this edge nice and flush with the base of your plinth as well, because that will keep your project nice and square. Now, the next component that we're going to be dealing with is our main box side. And this is that thick component. Now, you can already see where I've applied some double-sided tape, and that's where I'm going to apply my adhesion next. And I'm simply going to position that in place so it's going to be flush with the back corner and flush with the base. Right, so that's both sides on now and everything is still nice and flush with the base and you can begin to see how these edges are thickening up and becoming much stronger. Now, you may notice at this stage that the back is starting to bow a little and that's because these little side flaps that are holding them in place are quite thin. Don't worry about it, that internal strengthener that's on the base of the top will rectify that further into the project, so don't worry about that. Now the next component that we're going to be looking at is the main box corner rear and I've actually found that there was an error in my instructions and I, I will correct that document for you. Now yesterday with that particular component we scored on the portrait at three quarters of an inch and a half an inch but we should have also scored at two and a quarter inches and glued the second flap down. Now I've done one off camera this morning just to show you what we should have. So this is what we did have at the end of play yesterday and we should have had a double layer on both sides. So that's just something for you to bear in mind. Now these corner components, the rear ones, simply get fitted on these corners here. And you can either glue it up as one lot and get the corners in position first, so sort of like that, and then you can hold those down. Or I do tend to just glue one face, allow it to go off a bit, and then put the other face down. I find that easier. But I'll leave it to you as to you know the approach that you take. Right, I know that time is of an issue, but I did just want to share with you this method that I use for these corners and just explain the reasons behind my logic in applying this approach. Now, all I've done with each corner is ascertained where the corner needs to be, having applied glue to just one face only, on the other side obviously in this case. So I then apply that into position and I can put pressure on these edges until I know that the glue has gone down. The problem that I've found with these corners is that as soon as you start to apply pressure on this other edge, if the glue isn't dry, there is a tendency for this card to want to be drawn away from its position here, so it could move slightly upwards. So I have found that just by putting one side down, and now that I've reached a point where I know that glue has taken, I can apply the glue here and then pay attention to this edge. So that's the method that I use. You must feel free to adopt your own approach, but I, I wanted to explain the reasons behind that. Right, so with those rear corners in place, we can now turn our attention to these front corner edges and we're using those front corner components for that purpose. Now these are the sections that we've scored and we've got one side that's got a double layer of card and one with a single. Now it's the double layer of card that goes on the decorative side of our box to mirror image the back corner. And if we turn that flap over to the front, we can see we've got some excess here and we want to remove that. So. All we're going to do is put that in position so that we can see that that's flush with the base of our box and then just hold that position so that we can get it tight against the top of the plinth in here and just using a pencil we're going to mark a line where that top of the plinth is. It's quite faint there but I hope you can see it. Now at this point, we can draw a straight line, just using that edge of that card as a guide. You could measure this if you felt happier doing it, but I tend to like to fit the box. So at this point, I'm just going to trim away that excess card, and I'm going to angle it very, very slightly 
because that will make it easier going into the box. And I'll trim along the edge. I'm not removing the um, fold line in this case. I'm just going to trim along the edge a bit. Now at this point, I follow the same method as before when I fit this to my box. So I will glue one face in position first so I will glue that to my box and then I will come and glue this section down and actually because it's quite a thick section I'll come back and show you how I'm doing that right so that outside double layer has had time to dry off a little on the decorative side of my card and I've already applied glue to this other side making sure that there's plenty along that front edge as well. So all I'm going to do, just in case it's of interest to you, is use my bone folder to sort of apply some pressure along that edge and coax that card into place where it needs to be. And once that's done, you can also use your fingers just to start to ease that around that thick edge that we've got to work with there. Just getting rid of any excess glue. Now. Once you've got that over, you can then get to this inside and apply pressure along there with a bone folder in order to make sure that it's got a good bond. Now the next item on our list of things to do is our main box top. And yesterday we were able to score in the lines indicating the back of our box. So that's done. But we didn't know where the sides would be because we've got this extra thick layer to contend with so it would have been guesswork and it's easier to fit to the box so all that I do in this case is to place my component in place where it's going to be on a flat surface so that I can see I'm trying to lift it up to the camera inside the box that this strengthening position is actually tied up against the inside of this section of the box what I've then done is held that in place. I've done this on a flat position already because it, it's difficult to show you on camera. And with that in position, I've just drawn a line across the bottom there, only between these two pieces because we don't want to use this as a gauge. It's this middle section that we're concerned with. So I don't know whether you can see it. I've done that on both sides. So there's this line here which indicates the thickness of those side sections and that now gives me a place from which I know the side of my box needs to be. So that's the place for my fold line. Now what I'm going to do to make it easy for me to score is to extend that line to the front edge and just extend that line through to the front edge. I can now get my scoring board Keep everything nice and square at the top. And I can place that line over any groove. Doesn't matter which one. And that will then mean, as long as I keep everything square, I can score that line. In fact, I do need to do it right to the back, really. So, sit that in there like that. And that's then giving me my first score line, which is providing me with the shape for the top of my box. Now from this point, I know that this section of card is over length because I cut it that way to allow for that tolerance on that thickness. So all I need to do now, I'm placing that on the eight inch mark there. Doesn't matter which one you use, it's just so that I can more easily see the three quarter inch mark. So I can now score at the three quarter inch mark and again at another three quarter of an inch mark, so effectively a one and a half inch mark. And this leaves me with this extra bit here which I can cut away because it's excess. So I'm going to do that same process on this side and then I'll come back to you at that stage. Right, so we've now got the pattern piece for our top that is the right size. And what I've done is I've just folded and creased those score lines, you know, in the usual way. 
And what that now means we can do is we can remove the corner. Now, this isn't a tray style component. So in this case, we are going to remove all of these four segments. So I'll just do the one on camera to show you. And again, I'm removing all evidence of the fold line at the same time. So that's all you're doing, and you're going to do the same to this other corner. So I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so with the corners cut away, the next thing that needs to happen is that we create double layers of these extreme flaps. Now I've already done the back layer, just to illustrate that and make that clear for you. So that's what I'll do next, is just get on and glue those down as well. Right, so with those now all glued down, we can start to fit this top section to our box. Now in order to do that we're just going to place it on our box so that we've got an even spacing either end here. Now I just want to make you aware it will seem as though this lid is too small based on these score lines but that's because those score lines are marrying up with this thinner section of the box rather than the corner. So don't worry, it will all come together. So the first thing that we're going to do, just centralize that back tab so that we've got an equal distance at either end. And then we're simply going to mark the section where this edge is. So we're just going to mark that side there and do the same on this other end, just where they are. So at that, having got that mark point, we can use our ruler to draw that line. And I do find that quite difficult at this distance, but you don't want to see the back of my head. So we'll draw those lines in to start with. I think that's there. And then we can double check where they're going to rest in that top section by just offering it up again. So I can see roughly. Now I will probably cut either side of the line so there is a bit of a gap. It's up to you how accurate you want this fit to be. If I just show you this, I actually quite like it when there is a bit of a gap in between because it makes it look to me like it's more of a joint. So I tend to try and create a tiny gap, not too much. And I suppose if you err on the side of caution, you can always cut a little bit extra afterwards. So let's just cut that away. So I'm going to cut this side of the line just up to that fold line. And I'm going to leave that fold line intact. It will be hidden anyway underneath the top cover, but oops still a bit damp there. So that's one. So I will do the other one off camera because it's taking a bit of time. And we can just see how that's then going to slot in between the uh, two upright corners. Right, so that's now been fitted and I've applied glue just to one layer in the same way that we did with these corner sections so that that has now been positioned. Now, I'm just going to, uh, it probably as well, to let that go off a little bit, that glue, before you start tackling the sides, because you will start pulling on these sides and you, you want that place to be retained for that back piece. So, you know, it might just be worth going to make a cup of tea before you move on to the sides. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and repeat that process for both these sides. I'm not going to glue them, I'm just going to fit them. And I'll come back to you once we're ready to stick them down. Right, so those tabs are now have all now also been cut back so that they'll fit where I want them to be positioned. But before I glue those down, what I want to do is start squaring up the top of this box. And in order to do that, I'm going to apply glue along all these top layers here. It doesn't matter if some of them are not going to be covered by my tabletop section. And what that, that's going to allow me to do is to start ensuring that this strengthener section is positioned inside the top of the box where it wants to be and it's going to square up that box. So 
I'm just going to apply a liberal amount of glue in the normal way. Got used to me now, I expect, with my glue. Just get rid of the excess off my fingers. And then I can then position this and look at the inside to just check where that component is so that the edges of the box, when necessary, are in the right position at the top there. So that I think is worth doing and checking where it, don't worry about these top edges. This is going to be covered by that tabletop section. It's better that you square your box up. So once that glue has gone off, and I will give that time to go off, I will then glue down these side flaps and we can then deal with this front section. Right, so now that we've got all the, the back and the sides all fitted down and they've had a little bit of time just to go off, um, we can now sort out this front edge here and as long as we've positioned this internal strengthener in the right place we can simply use our bone folder and use the front edge of that to score a line and that will then make folding that line so much easier. Now at this point you can see that we've got excess in this corner. This flap needs to fold inside the box. So we're just going to trim a little off these edges to allow that to happen. And I don't tend to take it right back to this very corner. So I just take enough away. Hope you can see what I'm doing. To that sort, so it's very slightly in front. And then if I need to take any more off, I can. So I will sort that out, angle these edges, and get that to a position where I can glue that to the top edge of the box, and then I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so that's now neatly glued inside the box at the top there. And that's giving us a nice soft edge here as well to the front of our box. So the next thing that we're going to need to do is to mirror this situation here and we're going to be using the main box base edge component to do this and these are going to be fitted in the same way that you fitted these. So these are those sections that we folded in half and it's the folded edge so the raw edge goes to the base of the box and the folded edge to the top and you're just going to fit these in the same way that you did these sections. So I'm going to go and do all three. You've got three in total, so one for each side and one for the back. So I'm just going to mark it up with my pencil, trim it back and glue them in position. So I'll do that off camera and come back to you. Right, so we're now in a position having got all those sections in place around our base. We're now in a position to sort out this front section here and just tidy it up a little bit and strengthen it. And we're doing that with that corner front base section. Now, if I place it on that, you can see that it's over length. And that's again because we didn't know really quite how thick those sides were going to be. It you know it varies according to card thickness. So what we can do is we can just put that in position, make sure that everything's lined up where it needs to be and then use our customary pencil mark to just indicate, give some indication of what, what excess card we've got. Now if we draw a line, we can double check that. That's in the right place. So I'll just refit. And by the way, it's the double layer of card. This is another of those where you've got this double layer and a single thickness layer. It's the double layer that is going on the front of this section here. So I'm just going to double check the positioning of that pencil mark, make sure it's okay. And I think you, if you can see that, that's absolutely fine. So I will trim that back now. And I can then glue that to the front there and I'll be able to trim, but only, you know, as far as that fold line. And then I'll be able to trim these corners back so that that flap can go on the inside in the same way that we did this top section here. So that section is now adhered to that very front edge. I've trimmed the edges back, as you can see there. I've already applied my glue and I just thought that I would show you. You know, it's just a question of 
uh, repeating that process that we did before using the bone folder then your fingers just to encourage that flat back and then just sticking it down on the inside of the box and just applying pressure at that point and that now gives us a nice neat front edge to our box as well. So now that we've got our front neatening strip in there, that front corner piece, we can now start adding in, if I show you this box here, this final finishing layer here, and that creates this little lip, which is what our drawer will end up sitting on top of. Now to create that final plinth, we're using these base finishing strips that we sorted out yesterday. And I have already applied one of these to the back edge of the box here. I don't know whether you can just see that there. And the reason why I've done that is because I want to demonstrate one to you, but I want to show you the difference between the back and the front and, and sides. There are, there's, a, there's an order in this, I think, to keep a nice, neat finish around the base of your box. So my approach is to put the back layer in first and then go ahead and repeat it, that process with the sides. So let's start on a side. So as is often the case with this box, we are trimming to fit. So all of these are the same size and obviously our back section is much longer than our sides. So the first thing that we're going to do is to so reinforce that 3 eighths of an inch fold line that we created yesterday and we're going to place that on the box now in this particular position we're then going to mark up where it comes to at this extreme end so normal thing pencil mark so that we know where our score line needs to be so having established that, we can then place that line, as long as it's straight, on any of the grooves on our scoring board. Just fetch my bone folder. And then we can create that score line. As long as we keep this edge on the straight uh, section at the top here, we'll get a square line. Now once we've done that, we need another 3 eighths of an inch flat. So just from where we've scored, we're going to score 3, eight, three eighths of an inch beyond that score line again. And that gives us the amount of excess card we're left with. So all we need to do now is to put that fold line in place, that first one. We can do the second one as well if we want to, just to give us a cutting line. And then we're going to trim away that excess and it needs to be rough. Now at this point we want to start to create a bit more bulk along here because as I say that drawer is going to need a ledge to sit on so this needs to be a bit thicker than it is at the moment. So what we're going to do we're going to simply use that raw edge of that double layer of card that we put in place yesterday so this is the very soft edge this is the raw edge, so we're just scoring along there, and that will enable us to fold and then crease that line. Now that we've found that position, we're just going to repeat that process. And we're going to fold and crease that line as well. And we're going to just do that one more time. And then we'll leave it at that. Now we do require two little fixing tabs on this side section and these actually need to be the second point up from the base. So all I'm going to do is cut away the rest of the excess card. So I'll do one side. Actually I should have creased that last line as well. It doesn't look that straight so I'm going to just line that up with that crease line. There we go, it's going to be a bit better I think. Okay. 
And then what we can do is just cut away that excess card. I'm going to angle it slightly because I am creating a little tab and cut away that excess card. And then I'll angle that one into that corner. Turn that over, it's probably easier. And you do cut away the fold line as usual as well. So I need to repeat that to this other end as well and then I'll come back at that point. So having achieved that pattern shape, we're simply going to glue these folds in place like that. So we'll just be left with one flap that has a single thickness. And you know, this section with the tabs is qu now quite a thick layer. So I'll get that glued, which will mean it will be ready for fitting and I'll come back to you then. Right, so I've glued all of those layers down and I've also glued one of these end tabs down and this is why I wanted to show you the back in situ. If we take a look at this back section, the tabs go around the corner. So we've got one little tab evident on this corner on the, on the side section and one on the other side. Now when we come to fit the side section, we don't want a tab to be visible here. So if I just demonstrate, if we were to fit it this way, you don't want to have a little tab in evidence, you want to hide it. So whenever you've already fitted a, a, a section and used the tab, you're going to have to manage without the tab when you fit the adjacent corner. So we've still got the tab at the front, so we will have the tab on the front on that side. And then when we come to fit the other side piece in, in the mirror fashion, we'll have a little tab here. So the, the back one will be glued in the same way as it is here. Now, when you come to fit the front section, and this will, won't be wide enough, but you will glue down both tabs and that will then cover the ends of, of the other section here. So you do need to fit as you go because you can see that you know this is wider because it's going over the full length there. So you do need to fit as you go, but fit the back first, and then these joins are only visible at the back. And then if you fit the sides next, you'll have a nice flush front finish section at the end. So I'm going to fit the rest of those using the same sort of fashion. I'll glue that in place, glue the tab down, give that time to go off and then glue this base section by trimming down the corners. So we've done that before. I'm sure you know what you're up to in that respect. So I'll just get on and do that off camera myself. Right, so with that attached all the way around, that's actually our plinth finished. And we can turn our attention to the next item, which is the tabletop cover. And there's a little bit of work that we need to do before we can fit that. So we'll tackle that next. So what we need to do with this is simply cover it now. And in order to do that, we're going to cut across the corners, but we're not going to cut right into this corner. So I'm just going to sort of do a mitre cut, but space it away slightly, and you'll see why. So it could probably be cut a little closer than that, but they're on the side of caution, I think. And we just, um, I'll do one edge for you so that you can see and then we'll work from there. So all we're going to do is to help us with that score line by just using our bone folder along the raw edge as we've done before. And that's going to help us to fold that line in place along that edge. Now all we're going to do here is apply glue, plenty of glue, in the customary way. And I, with this project, I've been very messy with the glue. I'd rather get plenty of glue on and get things stuck well than, than you know, fuss around trying to not get glue all over the project. Now, obviously I'd take a lot more care if I wasn't going to be painting this project. Now, all we're going to do in the first instance is apply pressure to put this section down here. 
But with these ends, what you want to do is just apply your bone folder against that edge so that those ends come down. And then when you fold this section down, you're going to get a nice neat corner. So that's really all you're doing there. So I'll carry on and do the rest of camera and then come back to you then. Right, so that's the tabletop finished covered version. And you know, nice neat corners. And do pay attention to these corners whilst your glue is still wet because you can mold them to a certain extent. If they're protruding a little, put them down on a flat surface, use your bone folder just to shape them up. And that will mean you know that you've got a nice neat corner when it's got a painted finish as well. So having done that to the tabletop cover, we've got this tabletop embellishment layer, which is the one that's going to sit on the very top. You know, it's, it's this second layer here. So we're going to do exactly the same thing now. Just trim off these corners slightly further away from the corners and fold everything in. So I will repeat the process and come back to you at that point. Okay, so that's both of my tabletop sections now covered. And that means that we can glue them together. And that's fairly straightforward, so I will do that off camera. I'll just apply the glue to the back of this top section and then just line that hole up and, and make sure that the um, backs of both pieces are flush with each other. And that then should give me an even border on all these three remaining sides. So I will do that off camera. Now, we don't have the issues with warping that we had yesterday because we're dealing with thicker layers of card but if you do have time to just put this under a weight once you've glued it all together just to give that glue a little time to, to go off it's probably beneficial okay so i will come back once that's all together right so now that that's had a little time to go off we can simply repeat the process and apply some glue on the surface here line everything up so that that hole is nice and uh, evenly positioned and we've got an, a nice straight line at the back here. Now the only thing I would say is that because this is a much thicker and firmer component now than this section here, I do find that it's better to turn this upside down once you've got the glue in place and let that glue go off whilst the box is in this position. It just seems to come together better. So we can now turn our attention to our tabletop back stand and we're going to just place that in portrait mode on the scoring board and I'm going to score at one and three quarter inches and then I'm just going to turn that into landscape mode and score a tiny score line at the one eighth of an inch mark. The first thing I'm going to do is just crease that little tiny one eighth of an inch score line. It's not always easy with such a thin piece, but get it as straight as you can. And now I can just double check the fit on the back of my box because you know when you're covering this, it, it, uh, the tabletop can vary according to card thickness. So just want to make sure it's in the right place. So it's just the normal positioning and pencil mark. And then I can score that in the normal way and then I'll crease that line. So I folded and creased both those little end lines and also the, the other score line that we created. Now I do want to glue this as a double layer and that means that I need to trim away some excess card at this end and I will do the normal just remove it including the score lines so I'll just do this one and then I'll repeat that process at the other end and glue that down and come back to you at that point so with that glued down I now just want to find a central position on this point to just help me when I'm placing my embellishments so what I've got here I'm going to return to my template I'll do this off camera because uh, I need to put it on a flat surface where you won't be able to see it. But this template was folded in half so I can see where that central position is regarding 
in relation to this hole. So if I place the template in position on the top of my box, and just line everything up, I can then place the top edge in position and that's going to give me a point where I can mark. So that's what I'm going to do off camera. So having put a little mark, I've then extended that, I hope that you can see, with a pencil line just so that I've got in plenty of indication for my embellishment layer. Now the first embellishment that I'm going to fit to the front of that back stand is this one that's intact. So just one of those that's intact. So I need to be a bit careful. Now I know that I only place it on the upstand so that it's this little section here and below that actually is glued to my upstand. So as a consequence, I've only applied glue to that sort of area. It doesn't matter if you go above, but you know there's no point really if you don't need it at this stage. So all I'm going to do is I'm at this point, I'm just going to use my eye and roughly gauge where that central position is using that pencil mark. And then just placing this in place so that you know the, these little points are reaching the top of this stand. And at that point, I can apply some pressure to make sure that that sticks. Get rid of any glue that's oozed. I can now glue up the other side. So again, the intact one. I don't need any marker here because I can just use this shape. Lining everything up in the same way as we did when we embellished. And it's, it's the wrong side to wrong side. So both of these sides are now showing an embellished layer. So this side's embossed layer rather. That's embossed and so is that. So this is why you need to have a symmetrical die cut. So if you're substituting, do just bear that in mind. And at this point, we've now secured all those little pieces that were in danger of coming out of our die cut shape. So that's what we need to do in order to create that embellishment layer on the top of our backstand. And all we're going to do now, I'll do this off camera, you're going to take one of those double layered uh, die cut sections that we prepared earlier and we'll stick one on this side and then stick another on this side and that will complete that embellishment section. So I'll do that off camera and come back at that point. So with that embellishment now in place, we're just going to create another fold line using this existing raw edge. And you know we're going to do that in the same way that we've done with before, by just scoring along the edge there. And then we can just fold it. It doesn't need to be severely creased, it's just there as, a, as an aid for us. And what we can now do is place that on our box where it needs to go. Just make sure it's lined up and it's, it's basically that section is lining up with the edge of the tabletop so I know where that's going to be positioned. And we're doing the normal trick of fitting here because we'll you'll see as we get along what's happening. So I'm just going to mark with my pencil a little mark either side of here and that's going to give me the area of the flap that is going to allow us to fit this back stand to the back of our box. So I'm just going to draw that line in and cut away the excess card and then I'll come back to you. So with those pieces cut away, I've already placed some glue along this top edge and I've placed some glue on that tab. Now we're not going to stick these flaps down at the edges here, but we are going to use them for ensuring that we've got the correct position at the back of that tabletop. So we're just turning them around the corner. It doesn't actually matter if they stick, but they are going to need to stick down eventually. So we just apply that pressure to make sure that that upstand is glued in place where it needs to be. It will be flimsy at the moment because it hasn't got any side supports, but that is basically in place. 
I'm not worried about any excess glue because you know it will help with when I come to painting but you know I'll probably take off any severe excess. So I'll give that a moment to dry out and then come back to you. So the next thing we're going to do now is to sort out the support brackets at these edges. And for the first thing that we need to do is fit the one on the inside. And that's the that set of die cuts, the double layer that we created earlier and with no lugs fitted at all. So all I'm going to do is to apply some glue along the back edge of this so so and it's on the wrong side so the side that's not embossed so I'm going to put some glue along there and that's going to come into contact with that small 1 8 of an inch return and I'm just going to also just for good measure put a little bit of glue along this bottom section it's just going to help it you don't need to be worrying about the excess because the 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 um, piece that that marries up the other set of die cuts will be coming into contact with that anyway so we're just going to sit this on the top of that table top embellishment actually it could just go if you wanted to it could even go down the side of it and I think that's what I'm going to do on this occasion is keep that right so I'll show you in a minute I'll just try and set it in position so you're going to use this if we get it down on that bottom layer just at the very side and bring that little lug around the edge of it and that will help square everything up because we know as long as it's sitting we know that the angle is square so so if I bring that up, so I've just set that, I hope you can see, on the very outside edge, so this edge here, it's sitting just tightly up against the edge of this top section and it's sitting on this lower section and then pushed as far back as it needs to go. So that's what we're doing. So I'm, I'm going to let that just dry off a little bit and be sure of its positioning and then I'll come back to you. Right, I'm hoping that you can see how that's now positioned it's nice and neatly just tucked inside there now it is a little bit of a fiddly task because we've only got this little one eighth of an inch return and I did want to say to you I've limited to it to that size because otherwise it's going to go beyond these holes and spoil the aesthetic appearance of these corner brackets so if you're exchanging these embellishments for a substitute it, and you haven't got that same issue I would tend to extend the depth of this return and that will make this particular job a little easier for you. So with that in position we can now use our other half which is the layer of three and do remember that they're handed just check that when you're putting it you've got the little lug at the back and not at the bottom otherwise it's going to interfere with your positioning and lining up. So I've already put some glue on the back there to save time and I'm just going to, actually, I should have also put a little on the bottom here. So I'm just going to sit that on that bottom ledge now and line everything up. And this is why you do need to fit the internal one first, because you've got room to move this around and make sure that they line up. Um, if you put this on one on first, it might have been too far back and then your embellishments wouldn't line up. So that's fairly straightforward and basically strengthens up and finishes that corner. So I will repeat that process to this end corner here and that actually then finishes this main box component and we can move on with the drawer. Right, so we're getting somewhere now and we're moving on to our drawer section. Now I have realised that there are a few things that we're going to do now that could actually be done on day one if you've got the time. It's not critical, but you know, I'm going to alter the PDF document accordingly and then I can leave it to you as to whether you want to do it day one or day two. So the first thing we're dealing with here is our drawer front itself. So we've got that box drawer front 
but we laminated yesterday. So there's two layers of card here. And then we've got our draw front cover. And all I'm going to be doing is gluing the draw front to the center of the draw front cover like that. Because as with our tabletop, we're then going to be snipping corners and using this larger piece to cover the smaller piece. So I'll do that off camera and then come back to you then. All right, so whilst that's had having a little time to dry off, I'm going to turn my attention to the faux draw fronts and this is something else that requires layering and could be done on day one. Now I've actually um, drawn a line across from the diagonals each way in order to find the center point of this piece of card which is there and that's because the type of handle that I'm using is located at the center point and I need to punch a hole there. Now this is the kind of handle that I've chosen to use and it's actually a small draw pull but I will give you an idea of what you need to be searching for on the internet in case you don't have something like this in your stock. This simply works like a split pin. It's a two-part piece and that comes out entirely. So we'll be looking at fitting that later. Now, I did just want to say, though, that if you weren't interested in that particular handle type, there are loads of different handle types on the market. If you search for things like jewellery box handles, so I could have chosen instead to fit that kind of handle, and that's got two fixing points, so you would need to create a template appropriately. In order to punch my hole, I'm just using a little leather punch. It's just about a one eighth of an inch punch, but it allows me to punch anywhere on a piece of card and I find it really useful. I've got this little anvil as well and quite often you can buy them as a set. So, you know, that's fine. So all I'm going to do, if you haven't seen me do this before, I can just place that punch over my anvil and over that center point where I need the hole. And excuse me whilst I make a noise with my hammer, but I'm just gonna give it a big whack. There we go. And that's punched that hole through there. So a really useful little tool to have. Now, I want to have holes through all four pieces of my card because we're layering two together. So I'm just going to use that as a template and I'm going to punch the hole in there again and I'll do that with each four pieces of card so that I know I've got my holes positioned centrally. Now it's also easier to punch that hole through one layer on the draw front cover. So we're going to be using a larger piece of card to cover our draw fronts. So I will do a similar thing before I've glued these together and I'll just line them up when I glue them. So I will punch the hole in that piece as well. Right, so now that I've got holes in all of my faux draw front components, so all three per draw, faux draw front, I'm now going to do what we've done several times already today. The two smaller pieces of card are going to get glued together and just put under a weight just to allow them to go off. And then once I'm happy that they've gone off enough, I will then line up all the holes and glue the faux draw front to the faux draw front cover. You've seen me do that today. So I'll do that off camera with both of the faux draw front sections and then I'll come back to you. Right, so that's the faux draw front sections now complete. And I'm hoping if I move that out of the way, you might be able to see that I've lined up all the holes, glued them all together so they're all laminated and ready to go. And we can now cover those um, first smaller sections of card. Now, just as a reminder, this is our draw front cover that has the same process applied to it, but without the holes in this one. And I've snipped away the corners just as a reminder to you. So you're snipping away the corners just slightly away from this internal corner. You'll use your bone folder down the edge to help you fold that line, apply the glue and just turn the these edges over to cover that internal section. So I'm going to do that off camera because we've already been through that process and then I'll come back to you once that's done. Right, so we're now able to return to our main 
draw section that we started yesterday and the first thing that we're going to do is to create a three-sided box and we're going to do that by drawing this larger flap up and then gluing these smaller flaps to the underside of it so that the large flap forms a nice neat floor to the base of our drawer. So I'm just going to apply the glue to these two sections and glue them down. It's straightforward. I'll do that off camera and then come back to you. Right, so with that job done, we now want to further reinforce this base by layering up the card. And to do that, we're going to take this external side reinforcing panel, just one section of that. And we're going to simply glue that in place, lining up all the edges. And then we're going to leave that in that position just to give it a chance to dry off a bit. So I'll do that and come back to you when that's complete. Right, so now that that's glued to that base, just simply like that, and it's had enough time just to bind, I'm going to do that usual thing. Use my bone folder to score along that edge to, to make a fold more easy. And then I'm just simply going to fold some of that excess up onto the side of the box and then I'm going to glue that in place. So again, I'll do that off camera and then come back to you. Right, so with that in place, the next thing I'm just going to do is that same thing. So just score along that edge line so that this piece of excess card can more readily be folded. But I'm not going to be gluing that in place at the moment. That's just ready for that. Now you may have noticed that that's only reinforced one side of our box. So we have got a second external side reinforcing panel. And I'm just going to repeat that same process all the way through so that we reinforce this side as well. So I may as well do that off camera and then come back to you when that's ready to go. So having completed that reinforcing to both sides of the box, we're going to do a similar thing to the front of the box as well, not just to strengthen it, but so that we can start to neaten up some of these edges. Now, to do that, we're going to take our external front and base reinforcing panel. And all I've done is I've placed that in my scoring board and I've scored a line at a half an inch interval and I've folded and creased that line. Now that piece of card, this is the front of the box, bearing in mind it's a backless box, that is going to be positioned flush with that top edge and it's got this nice half inch sort of return and I want to duplicate that on this other side and you know there's too much excess card here so we're just going to do our normal fit I'm going to put my pencil line there that's going to give me my first score line then I will score a half inch away from that and trim off any excess and I can fold and crease that line I'll come back to you at that point just to clarify right so now that's that process has given me a section that has a section in the middle that's the width of the front of my box and then I've got a half inch return on either side. So that's what you're aiming for. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to line that up so that the amount of excess at the top of this re front reinforcing panel is the same as we've got for the sides. And I'm then going to use my uh, bone folder make sure it's in straight to score that line and then I can just fold and crease it I know it hasn't gone all the way across but it'll sort itself out so just crease that in and then I just need to do the usual trick of rem removing the sections the excess sections in the corner and I'll do that off camera so with those corners trimmed away now, including the fold line, I'm just going to apply some glue on the front of my box and just glue that in position. I can use that flap to help guide me. So I'm just going to glue that front into position and leave it to go off a little. Right, so with that in position, I'm now going to score along this baseline, just for ease of folding. And then I'm going to fold this section back and I'm just going to draw a line to indicate where I've got excess card. 
I'll, I'll then complete that line with the ruler and trim that back because we don't want the card to protrude further than the back of this base section. Right, so that's the excess trimmed away. So that can be thrown away. And, and that edge now is flush with the back of our box. Now the next thing I want to do is just about a half an inch down from this point here, the base of our box, I'm going to make a snip into that fold line. And I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. It doesn't have to be precision engineering, you know, just a rough half inch down. It's just creating a little tab. And at this point, I'm going to cut away this excess, including the fold line. So I'll do that off camera and come back to you to show you for clarification. So just so that you can see, so that, that flap has been removed from this base section, but a little tiny bit, a half inch bit has been left beyond the base of the box. And at that point, you can then glue this flap down to the box side, which is what I've done here, just so that you can see. Now, the next thing that I'm going to do is just snip into this section here, into the corner of the box. Because now you can see where the corner of the box actually is going to be. And that means that little tab can get glued down. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'll do that on both sides and then we'll be ready to glue the base down. Right, so I just wanted to make sure you could see that. So the sides are down and the little tabs have just been glued over the, around the corner onto the base itself and that's strengthening that corner as well as making it nice and neat. So the next job that I'm going to do is simply apply glue to the base section and glue this vinyl pan panel in place. Right, so now that the base is down, we're going to be able to just to neaten up these raw edges at the back of our box drawer. And to do that, we've got these external binding strips. There's three of them. And all I've done is place them in my scoring board in portrait mode and scored at the half inch mark folded and creased that card. As usual, these are oversized, so I'm going to be doing the sides first and the base last, and I am going to fit to the box. So it's just that normal thing. I'm not going to waste your time demonstrating this on, on camera because you've seen it quite a few times already. So it's just a question of placing it in position in the normal way on the side of the box, lining up the top section with the top of the box. So it's nice and flush, but the same as, as the one at the front here. So then you can take a pencil, indicate where the excess card is, trim that back, and then stick that to the edge of the box. So I'll get it to that point for clarification and then come back to you. Right, so just let you have a look at that. That's just been trimmed to fit, so it fits top to bottom. That's going to be the top edge. And it's simply being glued on one side. And I've done that to both sides of the box at the back. So all I'm going to do is trim this corner so that this flap can then be positioned and glued on the inside. And I'll do that to this side as well. We can then treat the base in exactly the same way. So we'll fit that across there and just deal with it in the same way. So I don't actually think I need to demonstrate that to you because you've seen it, uh, seen this process already over the last couple of days and you know, it's just wasting your time. Right, so that's all those finishing strips fitted and I hope you can see that starts to give a lovely soft, neat edge to the back of our draw section. Now we just need to follow a very similar process for these top flaps now and I've already done one to show you and again we've got this nice soft edge and the flap is glued inside the box. So all you need to do is trim a very small amount off the top edge of this just because you've got this width here that you know it's not going to get past so I'm just going to take a slight section just not quite to the bottom. 
and then I'll glue that up and stick that down and do the same thing with this front edge and that will take us to a point where we can start fixing our drawer front. Right, so now that we've got our box drawer to this stage, we can bring in our drawer front cover and look at fitting that. Now, I'm going to show you the way that I do this. It's the best way that I can find. You might find something that's more precise, but hey ho, let's show you what I do. Now, the first thing is that I make sure that I position my box onto my cover. I have already done this off camera because I knew it would be difficult off camera to a point where I've got an equal amount either side of my drawer. So I've got an equal margin this side with this one, just, just as an eyeball thing. And then I've drawn with my pencil a line along there to indicate that. So I don't know whether you can see that line just there. And that's going to help me just double check when I'm gluing things together that I'm, you know, I, I've got all edges in the right space. That's the first thing that I find useful to do. Now, the second consideration that I've got to take into account is the fact that we're going to be painting this item. So I can't actually position this on my jaw front so that this sits on this lip because by the time we've added paint, it's quite surprising. You can easily add another millimeter to this area when you've got a coat of paint on here and on here. So there's an unknown quantity there. So the main thing is, whatever the measurement is there from, from the lip, you can see that, whatever the, the distance is from the lip of this plinth section to the bottom of our box, we need that equivalent measurement. So once we've got our uh, drawer front on, we need that equivalent measurement to be less on here. So it, it, if, you know, Otherwise, it's going to not sit in the right place. That measurement from the bottom of the drawer cover to the bottom of the drawer, we want some protrusion, but it must be less than the one on the box. Now, the best way that I've found to do this is to take a pile of, of card. And this is, you know, it's not scrap card by any means, but at least it's all even and straight. So I can then place that on the top of that plinth and see just how much clearance that's giving me, those two layers are giving me, is it going to give me enough of a space for my drawer cover? So I'm actually happy with those two thicknesses of card as a spacer. So having ascertained that, we can get rid of the main box section for the time being. We can bring in that spacer section of card and place our box on it. So the front is actually just slightly over the front of that spacer. So it's not going to get any glue on it. You don't really want to waste any card. And at that point, we can keep an eye on our pencil marks. We can apply glue to the front of the box, put it in position, and then draw our front cover up to it. And that what that also means is because both of the both our box base and the base here are on a flat surface we're also going to apply that in a square fashion and when that goes into our box it shouldn't look skewed so that's the method that I've come up with that's exactly what I'm going to do off camera because I'm bound to get it wrong if I try and do it on camera. You know, it's going to end up glued in the wrong position and that will spoil the whole project. So I'll do that off camera. You, you, I think that should be clear enough for you to understand what I'm doing and then I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so with our draw front cover in position and just drying off slightly, we can now turn our attention to these little faux drawer front covers and we're just going to finish them off with the last of those embellishments and all that means is that we are going to glue them into the corners with a nice even spacing as much as we you know can get with our eyes and then that's just being glued in the way that i've shown you how i've glued the embellishments previously in this project. So I'll get on and get all of those four done. They're just going to be placed in position like that and then I'll come back to you. Now having got your faux 
draw front covers to this stage with the embellishments and they're really substantial now actually if you are painting your project you really do need to paint them before you go any further and that means that you can totally cover this area where your handles are going to go without there being any risk of you getting paint all over those handles. Now just in case some of you aren't planning to paint your project I am going to give you a dry run through of what it is that you need to do to finish the project off but because I am painting I'm not going to actually do the gluing so you know please forgive me for that. So we've now got our draw front cover and our draw fronts will be positioned you know where you find them most aesthetically pleasing really I tend to try and leave a nice gap in the middle so assuming that these were painted we would now be in a position where we can simply feed our handle into that draw front and do make sure these are directional so these you know you do if I was to twist that round that handle is going the wrong way so just be aware of that so with these particular handles there is a direction make sure before you put the clasp in at the back that actually your handle is looking okay from the front and at that point you can just use these split pins to secure them So that's all I will be doing at the stage that this is nicely painted and incidentally I will paint these at the same time that I paint the rest of the project but when I'm painting this section I'm just going to paint around the outside and across the middle because I need you know I don't need to just paint this area it's a waste of my time because I'm gluing something over the top of it now at that point I can once the handles are in place I can happily glue these faux covers in place too and I'll just use my uh, ordinary PVA glue but it you know you do need plenty of it and it does need time to go off so just bear that in mind so as long as you're using a strong glue for that it will be absolutely fine now at that point if you're not painting your project will be complete so just for the benefit of those of you who won't be wanting to watch any more tutorial at that stage your tissue box will be able to go into your drawer and you'll be able to pop it inside your box and there we go and that will be just have to use your imagination a little with regard to your drawer embellishments. Now I will put the details of the paint that I'm using in the description area for this video but it's basically paint that I've had left over from a furniture project and it's actually Dulux quick dry satin wood mid sheen it's for wooden metal and the color is natural calico now the only thing I would say is there's loads of paint out there that you could use and I would just advise that you did as I have had to do and take a scrap piece of the card that you've used for your project and test the paint that you're planning to use and see how the card reacts I actually thought that I would need to put in a coat of gesso before I use my paint and actually I tested with both and I preferred the effect of not using the gesso first. So do just do that test, you've put a lot of time into this project, you don't want to ruin it at this stage. Now the method of painting that I'm about to show you could be considered to be quite unusual and quirky but it is a method that I find works well for me and if you're not sure where to start it may at least give you a basis to move forward with. So to start with I don't use a paintbrush, I use a sponge and I just use these scouring sponges that you can get in the supermarket and I cut a piece off that suits the project that I'm going to be working with. So in this instance it's just a really small piece of sponge that's manageable for me. Now because I like a smooth paint finish as much as possible I only use very small amounts of paint and I put on thin coats which then dry very quickly and that allows me to apply several coats in a short space of time. 
Okay, let's just show you. I'm not going to paint the whole thing. So that's a tiny bit to start with, and that's going to be lost very quickly on this particular component because you know that the it will absorb very quickly into the dry substance. So this is all I'm doing. Just it's almost like when you wipe this your kitchen surfaces, you know, to get um, to get rid of the the mess. You don't leave any moisture behind. You just um, you know, you're just trying to get rid of the dirt. You're not trying to leave any moist uh, water behind or anything like that. So it's that kind of technique in a way. And with the sponge, you can apply pressure and it will get into these nooks and crannies. So I, I'm hoping that you can see it's a tiny amount of paint that I'm putting on. I'd rather put less on and come back than to get too much on that's then going to create uh, sort of mounds and marks in the paint finish and not retain that nice flat surface. So I'll just do a little bit more just to give you the idea. So I'm rubbing quite hard with that into that component just to make sure that the sponge is taking up any of the excess quite a quick process as well. So that's all I do and I keep repeating that process, allowing that time to dry off and keep repeating the process and gradually you get, get a build up of paint and you'll get a full coverage. The only other thing I should perhaps mention is that sometimes, depending on the size of your sponge, these little corners can be tight and you may not get at them with your sponge. In that instance, I would possibly create, cut out a little triangular pointed sponge to get at those. But alternatively, you could simply use a small paintbrush to apply a little bit and then go over with your sponge to pick up any excess. So that's the best I can give you really. It is the method that I use. I do find it gives me a nice flat surface with little requirement for sanding, if any. So that's how I go about things. Now the final product, having applied a number of layers in that fashion, is this finish. So, you know, quite a thorough coating and uh, also a very flat one. So you've not, you know, lost any of this detail that we need if we want to have an effective wash coat. So before we start, I do just want to make you aware that this wash finish that I've used to achieve an aged finish, the method is not necessarily technically correct. It is just what I did. So I'm just giving you a base from which to start. Now I can't tell you whether there are any specialist paints that you have to use for washes, but what I will tell you is that I've simply used my artist's acrylic colors. This set is a Winsor & Newton set. And in this case, I'm using this yellow ochre. Now I've simply put a pea-sized amount of paint in there and watered it down very thoroughly. So you're ending up with a very watery mix. Now the first thing I'm going to show you is this sort of lined technique and that is very easy to achieve. So that's the very first thing we're going to look at. So in addition to my little jar of watery paint, I've got a couple of brushes here. In fact, I've got three in total. I've got this a smaller one and I've got this flat one which I like to keep as a dry brush and this larger one to apply lots of paint with if I need to. Now, the other thing I've got is a couple of tissues or you could have, you know, it's just an absorbent material you need because you need to try and keep one of your paint brushes as dry as you can. So let's get started. And this is experimental. I would suggest that, you know, you just have a play um, maybe use some scrap uh, card that's been painted up to start with just to see how things work out. All I'm going to do this is very watery. I hope you can see. I'm just laying down some of that water. Now there is also with this paint, your paints may react differently. This paint seems to have a water resistance aspect to it. 
so it actually doesn't absorb into the paint particularly so that brush I can keep wet it doesn't matter about that but now with my dry brush I'm going to start drawing some of that liquid off stripping off actually but you can see how it's settling in there and I probably want to leave it in those areas a little bit because the whole idea is to have areas that whether it's raised up where perhaps the dirt would collect and so you get these dark shadings and so that's what you're trying to achieve now the paint will it will dry darker and in this case I wanted the effect to be quite subtle so I'm going to just keep working away at it and I will probably apply a second layer and work it again I don't know whether you can see that effect but you you're basically just using a dry brush to create sort of lines of the paint and as it dries those lines will become more visible if I just lay a little bit more down on this area here that's the other thing you can keep laying the paint down and you don't need to go the full length if you don't want either you can just do certain areas I've done that on some of my furniture on some of the drawers just gone along on certain areas so just draw off with a dry in areas that I don't want it to be so apparent in fact, I might even let it settle down a bit there I'm just going to draw that off. I think you can start to see there where you may be getting a few lines. But it is really a matter of just experimenting with it really. Keep drying off that paintbrush. really do want that's already quite moist. Because it draws it off in a sort of a capillary action. But it's just going to give this a hint of colour. Let's see if we can make a comparison. I might see it a little bit better. It's just a shame that I needed this to be quite a subtle difference. So you can probably start to see shades of that yellow tan colour coming through. And as that dries, they will become more emphasized. It's probably not as emphasized as the prototype in this case, because I used a much darker wash. So that's the difference there. So that's really all you do. Right, so we can now start to take a look at these more 3D embellishments. And they are a little bit more tricky. Now, in trying to achieve that age look in these three-dimensional areas, the thought process that I have is that when dirt builds up on things over time, what tends to happen is that it settles into these lower areas. And because of people perhaps handling the area, any raised areas tend to remain a lot cleaner because the, the touching action tends to have a polishing and cleaning effect so in applying the aged finish what I was trying to achieve was to get these lower areas darker and then the raised areas more clean so the first thing that I do in this case and I hope you'll be able to see this is that I'm applying a wash all over that area so just letting it flood into those areas and that's just my starting point. The next thing that I would do is to use the dry brush again to draw up that excess moisture and just keep drying that brush out. So because the dry brush acts you know has a capillary action about it and it does then soak up into that dry paintbrush and it but it leaves a residue as well 
Now the only problem that I found with something this small is that it's difficult to just polish the raised areas. If I was to use a rag this size and polish off the top, I'm going to take out everything that I've just put on. And that was what was happening. So I'm using in this instance just a little cotton wool bud which gives me a little bit more control. It still probably takes away more than just these raised areas, but it does help me. So that's basically one way of doing it. And then if I leave that to dry off, you, I think you can probably start to see that the wash is collected in these areas it's just soaked in and collected in these areas now you can when you're having a go yourself you can keep applying reapplying the wash letting it dry see what effect you like and polishing it off if you don't like it worst case scenario you can even repaint so that's that's the starting point now i do obviously want to do these lines effects so i'm going to just get those in place now as well so just that starts to apply a second layer of wash in certain areas. It's all on that same surface. So then I can go in again with my dry brush, as we did before, and just draw off the excess. But it's going to start to give that area of this project a more yellow appearance. And it'll seep into this line here as well. So that just starts to create some of that aged look. So keep drying off that brush so that it draws off some of that wash. So that's that same method that we first looked at. So I'm just going to go in again because we've applied extra wash to these raised areas and just start to polish it out. Now, because this is quite a delicate uh, embellishment with not a great deal of depth, normally if you're applying a wash to something with deep, uh, that's got a, quite a depth to it, then you know you can polish away and you'll, you'll get an effect much more easily than you will with something this shallow. Now, what I have done to help me get more of an effect is to take a bit more control. Now I'm, I'm swapping over to smaller brushes. So I've got this small brush here, which is my dry brush, and this tiny brush here, which is my wet one. So all I'm going to do, in order to try and keep those raised areas clean, I'm just going to apply small amounts of wash. So just flood the wash into the areas where I want it. There's not much going on there, is there? There we go, that's a bit better. So just so that it can soak in, and then I'll take my other brush, and you can see how that draws that off. And it means that some of these raised areas aren't being impacted, so I'm not just keep undoing everything that I've already done. So it's not conventional, but actually needs must, and. You know it works for me so it just gives you another idea as to how you can get the same effect but take a bit more control of it so just I'm not painting that in I'm just dropping in that water and I'm using the same technique to draw it off again now in the same way you can you could put little bits of color into these slight areas away from in between those embossed areas. Now that's entirely up to you, but you could in effect create that effect that you can get with a larger item just by taking a different approach, adding in rather than polishing off. So I'm hoping that that gives you somewhere to start. And if you're new to that completely, you know, have a play. That's how I started and it, it certainly helps. Now, I just wanted to show you 
up close a little bit. So this was the prototype, slightly different design, and that was using a darker wash. This wash that I've finished today is a much more subtle one. Now this has been a major tutorial and I do really appreciate you taking the time to watch it and I hope that you can join me at a later date to see what else you can make out of card.